Welcome back after the break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we began looking at kingdom culture. Uh, we were looking at the facets of kingdom culture. And the first one is a culture of honor. So we looked at, you know, when we honor somebody, why do we honor somebody? They're valuable, okay, and also who and what they mean to us personally, and also because of who they, who God has placed them in our lives, okay, someone who is, you know, uh, uh, leading God's people well, somebody who's laboring in the word, the doctrine, okay, so we honor them, okay. When you honor somebody, how do you treat them? How do you act towards them? What is our natural instincts when we when we want to give honor to somebody? We greet them. How do you show them respect? Okay, do you obey whatever they say. Be mindful of what you say. Not obeying whatever they say. Okay. Okay. How do you show the reverence in your attitude? How? How? Polite. How do you show polite? You just stand up. You wish them the way you speak to them, the way you stand in their presence, the way you serve them, okay, you listen to them, you applaud them sometimes. Yes, you don't backbite them. Exactly, yes. You don't backbite, you don't do anything that will defame them or will destroy their reputation or their uh, character. Okay, so you even give in to their lives, whether it's financially, gifts, whatever. So that way you serve pe uh, people and you also honor them. Okay, um, you know, when you honor somebody, you receive through their life. Okay, you receive through their life. So like Prince was asking me just before we went for our break, you know, ma'am, why do we have to give double honor to those who are leading God's people well, who are preaching and teaching the word and the doctrine, why do we have to give them double honor? Because we receive from their lives, okay? Um, like Pastor Bill Johnson, uh, you know, he's, he said in one of his sermons, you know, that um, Elisha was trained by Elijah, okay? And Elisha received a double portion of the anointing that was on Elijah and Elijah did more miracles than Elijah did. But then when John the Baptist came, who was the forerunner of Jesus Christ, he came in the spirit and power of Elijah or Elisha? Elisha or Elijah? He came in the spirit and the power of Elijah, not Elisha. So Pastor Bill Johnson says, why not Elisha, even though he had double anointing? He did more miracles than Elijah. Why did he come in the spirit and the anointing of Elijah? He's a teacher. He's the initiator. He's the father of the moment, mov uh, movement. Sorry, he's the father of the movement. Okay, so he. We see that God places honor on the one who paid the price to sow the seeds to pioneer a fresh move of the work of the. Holy Spirit or the fresh move of the work of God. So that is why we give double honor and it is not partiality. Okay. So it doesn't mean that we give double honor to only those who are preaching and teaching and pastors and evangelists and all of those things. And we give less honor to those uh, believers in the church. It doesn't mean that we're showing partiality. It's because we are receiving out of their life and their ministry. Okay. So uh, like we... Um, you know, uh, we read in Matthew chapter 10, verses 41 and 42. Can somebody read that? Matthew chapter 10, verses 41 and 42. Matthew chapter 10, verses 41 and 42. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive shall receive a righteous man's reward and whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple or surely i say to you he shall by no means lose his reward yes so when you 
honor a prophet when you honor righteous man you or a disciple you uh, who are who are disciples for the kingdom of god you receive their reward you receive from their anointing from their revelation okay uh, you receive a reward that represents who they are they they represent the kingdom of god they represent the king you receive their reward okay so that is about a culture of honor okay a culture of selfless giving okay so we also see that you know uh, the kingdom culture is described by a giving that is selfless giving of what Ta resources talents skills your finances your encouragement anything else and everything else so what are the characteristics of selfless giving what are the characteristics of selfless giving? Not expecting anything in return, very important. Always thinking of others. What else? Doing it cheerfully, not out of compulsion and being forceful, being spontaneous in your giving and your doing. It basically comes from your heart. Okay. So, uh, so how do we see selfless giving? How do we know somebody is giving selflessly? When you see them giving happily and doing it joyfully? Joy and no, no demand and no kind of irritation. Uh, not for seeking attention, yes. You're not looking for attention, applause, for appreciation. But you're looking, you're serving behind the scenes. Even what you are doing goes unnoticed and unappreciated. You're just doing it because you 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 have that selfless giving. Okay, the selfless love. Okay, um, and the selfless giving is seen is a characteristic of kingdom culture. So if you are people who are looking for appreciation, applause, you know, some people say, I did so much, I worked like a donkey, no one appreciated me. No one even applauded me. No one even came and said, thank you. You know, then you know that they are not selfless in their giving. They're not just actually serving God, but they just want, they're doing it partially as yes, serving God, but most of it because they want to be identified and known. Okay. Uh, and also, how do we identify selfless giving? Okay, out of love. How do you know they're giving out of love? How do you know they're generous? Huh? They don't expect anything back. When we see people who are just giving all of their time, resources, their opportunities, their success, they invest just their time and energy in serving people and furtherance of the kingdom of God, we see that they have selfless giving. Okay. Yes, we saw the see the lives of so many missionaries, and that is totally just selfless giving. Okay. Um, and it's not a giving that. You know, we're receiving back in uh, in return. It's a kind of giving that where we expect nothing back, okay, uh, from those who have received from us. But we know that we will receive a reward in due time, okay. And that is a kind of giving that is motivated by love for God and for His people okay so that is a kind of culture that we have to have in our homes in our families in our relationships in church wherever we go imagine if we have this kind of culture of selfless giving you know just giving 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 and not expecting anything in return even when you're condemned even when you're put down you just love you just give you know you just care uh you know it will just make the other person know you know how you know what kind of a person you are what kind of kingdom culture you have and they will really be they'll able to see god in your life okay it's a kind of giving that is motivated by the words of the king when he said in matthew chapter 25 verse 40 can somebody read that please matthew chapter 25 verse 40 so nina john says there may be sacrifices involved 
I can't say there may be, there is sacrifices involved. There will be sacrifices involved. And sometimes the sacrifices can be really painful, really difficult. But then you just experience the righteousness, peace, and joy of the Lord. And it makes the sacrifice really worth it. Yes. Thank you, Nina John. Matthew 25, 40. Can somebody read that, please? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Yes. She did it as much as to one of these, least of my brethren, you'd have done it to me. So what did we do? Even just give a cup of cold water. You know, it is just doing it for the king. And it's just so difficult, so hard sometimes. And it's just the grace of God and it's the love of God. And that is why we're saying kingdom thinking, kingdom lifestyle translates into kingdom culture. If we have not reached that kingdom culture of selfless giving, we need to check our kingdom, whether we have kingdom thinking and kingdom lifestyle. Okay. It's also a culture of daring faith. You know, people... Uh, a culture that is characterized by people who have da daring faith, who the people who stand strong in troubles, tribulations, adversity, with a smile on their face and joy in their hearts. Okay, the smile in their face and joy in their hearts. Even that smile and the joy can be can be painful, but it's just because the peace and the joy of the Lord that is so evident in their lives. It's also a daring faith where people step out of their boat, so to say, you know, in their everyday life and they are risk takers. They're, they don't mind putting their reputation on the line and seeing God's kingdom come, his will be done. They're not, you know, they don't hesitate to put even their lives on risk. They're very daring. They're very bold to just go out and do what God has called them to do. So they're motivated. And what is their motivation to take this daring risks? Faith. Faith that God will be glorified at all costs. Okay. I might look like a fool. I might look stupid. I might look like somebody who's just falling down at this person. But, you know, I'm just doing because God can be glorified at all costs. Okay, so God is looking for people with this kind of faith. Okay, and why? Because he knows that this kind of faith is going to advance the kingdom of God. So we have to have bold, daring faith, we'll take the risks, do what we need to do, you know, to just love God and to see his kingdom uh, further and move and grow and, uh, you know, God to be glorified at all cost okay so if we have this kind of faith wherever god has placed us you know it is going to bring about the kingdom presence the kingdom reign and rule the kingdom culture okay it is this kind of faith that is going to bring about healings deliverance miracles signs and wonders to take place why did the early church have great signs miracles and wonders that they witnessed because they had daring faith Okay, selfless giving. Remember, they sold off everything, came and gave it to whoever had a need. And also there was honor. Okay, we don't see that honor nowadays in church, whether it's one believer against the other believer. We don't see this selfless giving. We don't see this daring faith. Okay, and daring faith to the extent that even when they are persecuted, what did they do? They don't, didn't go and run and hide. They started wherever they went. They wherever they went, they preached the gospel. So they spread out from Jerusalem, but wherever they went, they preached the gospel with great signs, miracles, and wonders. Okay, not only those who were apostles, but those who were also just like Philip went to Samaria, Acts chapter eight, did mighty signs, miracles, and wonders. A whole town was rejoicing, celebrating, filled with the joy of the Lord. Okay, So when we have, so many people say, why don't we see this kind of signs, miracles and wonders in our church? Why? We don't have the kingdom culture. What is the kingdom culture we don't have? There's no love, there's no honor, there is no daring faith. Okay, so next it brings us to kingdom culture. Okay, we see Philip, Philip when he went to Samaria, he spoke about the name of Jesus and the things concerning the kingdom of God. And what happened? 
unclean spirits left the lame walked you know people were whole and what did it cause among the people unity they rejoiced they rejoiced rejoice means what righteousness peace and joy was there very evident which is the characteristic or characterizes the people who live in the presence or who live in the kingdom of god or people who live in the midst of the kingdom of god so righteousness joy uh, and peace in the holy spirit is characteristics of people who live and experience the kingdom of god in their midst and nothing can steal this joy and we saw this even in the early church nothing whether it's persecution slander you know whether people put you down talk behind you you know gossip or you know, humiliate you criticize you you know whatever you know you, you're not going to lose the joy of the lord the joy of the lord is expressed not only in our smiles in our cheerful laughter but also this calm sense of assurance and peace in the midst of any and every situation no matter what the situation is okay and it's also the ability to, to be the ability to be light even in the when the you know things of this world can be so you know uh, uh, weighing upon you can be so overpowering you can be so saddening you know you can just have the joy of the lord you can have you know this calmness this assurance is overwhelming peace okay and only this peace and this joy um uh, will you know will infiltrate and bring about a sense of unity and oneness and fellowship in our uh, in our gatherings okay it's it's also the peace and joy the righteous the peace and joy which will bring about uh, you know a, a a kind of a force that will you know get us to all stay together and stick together in spite of persecutions in spite of difficulties in spite of um, hardships even when the things of this world are pulling us apart even when the forces of the world are coming against the church advancing against the church you know it is this peace it, it is this righteousness joy and peace in the holy spirit that will help us to stay together and stick to together uh, and also bring about unity and fellowship in the body of Christ okay so if we, like we read in first peter chapter 1 verse 8 can somebody read that first peter chapter 1 verse 8 first peter chapter 1 verse 8 can somebody please turn in your bibles and read first peter chapter 1 verse 8 uh, whom having not seen you love though now you do not see him at believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory amen so a kingdom culture is an in environment of such joy in expressible and full of glory okay so joy that is in expressible you can't just express this joy but this joy is there and it is a it's it's a it's an environment that you will it just experience the glory of god in its fullness okay so that is another uh, characteristic of the kingdom culture or that is another facet of the kingdom culture so what are the facets so far we saw selfless giving culture of honor selfless giving daring faith righteousness peace and joy okay okay and the last one is a culture of um, invading earth okay now a kingdom culture is incomplete without you know heaven manifestation of heaven here on earth because we are praying what your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and we also we see jesus come in and assuring the kingdom of heaven which means what whatever is in heaven he is bringing it here he is assuring it here he wants it to be part of the uh, the culture and the lifestyle that we are living here on earth okay so it is actually releasing <coughs> sorry it's actually releasing here on earth what is in heaven okay 
um, and it's also doing God's will here on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, it's not God's will for anyone to be lost, but to save. And also, it is God's will that people be healed, demons be cast out, and the captives be set free. Um, everyone hear the good news of the gospel. Okay, the hungry to be fed, the naked to be clothed. Uh, the widows and the orphans to be cared for, those who are mistreated, abused, you know, to receive help and hope, okay? So this is heaven invading earth. That means whatever is not in heaven, there's no poverty, there's no sickness, there's no shame, there's no abuse, um, there is no uh, sadness, there is no uh, murder, whatever, you know, we see that kind of culture of heaven invading here on earth. The, a kingdom culture will be an environment where all of these things will happen. So who, who brings about this? We. Yes, we are people who are kings and priests. We are the people who have to speak into our lives, into our situations, into our relationships, uh, you know, where we see this kingdom culture invade our lives and our relationships and our church and our families. Okay. Any questions on uh, kingdom culture? Online students, anyone has any questions, any thoughts, anything you'd like to share? All of you are very quiet. No questions? Yes. I'm just asking, like, if this statement is correct, like what I'm saying. Like, if there is kingdom culture, then there will be a revival, right? Yes. There is a kingdom culture, there will be surely a revival. So, which is the reason why there's a revival? <laughs> there is uh, we can't say there is no revival uh, there is a revival in the sense that God does not hold us accountable to what happens in the whole setting of an environment or in a whole family but if you and your family are desiring more of God more of his truth, more of his revelation, you are passionate about God, you are seeking God then there will be a revival in your heart. God will not stop that revival because others in your family are not walking in the same pace or in the same level that you are or desiring God in the same intimate way that you are. So also in the church, you know, uh, we can't say, for example, if we know in a church, if the pastor is, we know is not living according to Godly standards, there are some ways he's gone away. So it doesn't mean that those who come to church are not going to experience God's healing and power and receive his word, receiving, receive encouragement, peace and joy. They'll come back the same way. No. It's a place where the Holy Spirit will work and minister to their li in their lives. So yes, the Holy Spirit will admonish and correct the pastor. But if he's not, at the cost of that pastor, he's not going to let others suffer. Right? He is a good shepherd. He cares for all of us. He will minister to, to them. So yes, there will there is a revival that happens, but we can't see a big cob. We can't see a widespread revival in the sense of mighty move of God unless people come into that culture where they are really living that kingdom culture, and then you can see it. like the like the early church had that strong kingdom culture. So we see that spread. Yeah. But that does not mean that we don't desire, we still earn, we still cry out, we still pray, we still pray for our leaders, our pastors, our, and for our churches to come to that place. Yes. Good question. Very good question. Anyone else? Okay, if, we, if there's no more questions, we'll move on to the next interesting chapter, Kingdom Parables, where all of us love stories. Okay. And... Um, uh, kingdom, the kingdom of God is, you know, such an important subject in the Bible from the very beginning till the last chapter. The theme that runs throughout is the kingdom of God. And we already saw it in chapter one, right? Right in the beginning, Genesis chapter one, till the end, 
uh, the last chapter, uh, we see that God wants to establish his kingdom where people will inherit his kingdom. Okay, we see even the closing chapters of the Bible that Jesus sets up his own kingdom where he is going to be the king of kings and the lord of lords and he's going to extend his kingdom and his kingdom is going to be without any limit and no end. Okay, but when Jesus came to the earth, when he was teaching us about the kingdom, he spoke to people in parables okay and he spoke many parables to communicate what to communicate the kingdom of god to communicate the hidden truths concerning the kingdom of god the hidden truths the hidden revelations concerning the kingdom of god or the kingdom of heaven so we look at some of uh, these parables and we'll try to understand what is the hidden truth, the hidden revelation that God wants to communicate to us. Okay. So we see that parables reveal mysteries or hidden truths concerning the kingdom of God. So let's uh, turn to our Bibles and look at John chapter 3, verses 9 to 13. We'll just lay a foundation before we explore kingdom parables. Okay. We're just laying a foundation. We are looking at John chapter 3, verses 9 to 13. Okay. So can somebody read that, please? Nicodemus uh, answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and none know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who comes, he, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Sorry, dear. What did you read again? John three verse. You're reading about Nicodemus. That is asking about the born again. Okay. Sorry, I just got carried away. Okay, so you know, um, Jesus in this is conv having a conversation with a very learned man. Okay, uh, and uh, who is this learned man? Nicodemus is a scholar, he's a very learned man, and he goes to Jesus, and Jesus explains to him that he has to be born again. So Jesus is using something from the other world, that of natural birth, to tell Nicodemus something about the spirit, something about the need to be born from above. And is Nicodemus able to understand this? No, he's not able to understand. Okay. So in verse 9, Nicodemus answers Jesus. What does he say? How can these things be? So uh, Nicodemus is basically telling Jesus, you know, Jesus, what, you know, I can't just get, understand what you are saying, or I can't get what you are saying. And what does Jesus answer him? He says, we speak what we, most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify of what we have seen. And you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I told you heavenly things? And then he says, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. So he's telling Nicodemus, you know, Nicodemus is saying, you know, I can't understand what you're saying. And Jesus is telling him, I've talked to you about what? earthly things and you cannot understand me you can't follow me what will you do if i told you about heavenly things how are you going to understand it okay and jesus is saying i'm the only one who can tell you about these heavenly things why he want yes he has come down from heaven he's not just come down from heaven to the earth but also there is another fact that even though he's here physically on the earth, he's also connected spiritually or in his spirit man, he's connected with the father who is in heaven. And so he's saying, I can, I'm the only one who's able to tell you 
heavenly things, about the unseen things, about the unseen realities, about the unseen kingdom of God. And so, you know, um, he's saying, how will you understand? So here now, basically, Jesus is faced with a challenge. What is the challenge Jesus is facing? He's trying to make them understand things in their own world and they're not able to understand. And how are they going to understand when he's talking about heavenly realities, heavenly things? Okay. So, uh, you know, he's having a challenge here in his communication. He basically had to communicate to people like you and me about unseen realities, things about the kingdom, things about the world that he has come from. And, uh, you know, sometimes he is just speaking to us about these very things, you know, in our own world, and we're not able to understand. So to bridge this communication gap, you know, what is Jesus going to do? He's going to speak in parables. Okay, so he's going to talk about uh, parables. So when Jesus began to do that, he's doing what? He's basically telling stories from our world that unveil mysteries of his world. Basically, he's telling stories that we will relate to in our world, understand in our world, that will reveal, you know, untold mysteries or realities or truths or revelation of his world. And that is what parables are. Okay, what are parables? Parables are basically stories from our world, okay, that helps us to see things into the heavenly world or to get an understanding of things concerning the kingdom of God. Okay, so many times as when Jesus was speaking in parables, he would say, you know, know this, you know, or know what my kingdom of God kingdom is like, uh, you know, the kingdom of God is like, or the kingdom of heaven is like. And then he would tell us something from our world with the intent that we get an understanding of the mysteries, the truths, the realities of his world. But he will start by saying the kingdom of God is like, okay? And then he will come back to our world, and then he will get help us to get an understanding of his world. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 13, where we have a list of many of his parables. Okay. Um, but we look at Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 to 17. Can somebody read that, please? Matthew chapter 13, verse 10 to 17. And the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has to him, more, be, more will be given, and he will have abundance, but whoever does not have even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, the seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of these people have grown dull. Their ears are heard of hearing and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn. So that I should heal them. But blessed are your uh, eyes for they see and your ears for they hear for assuredly i say to you that many prophets and uh, righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it amen thank you so the disciples are saying ayo jesus why are you speaking to us in parables we're just not able to understand. So Jesus is seeing their frustration, their disappointment, and he's saying, you know, don't worry because what has been given to you, to you has been given the mysteries of the kingdom. Meaning Jesus is telling his disciples, my disciples, God has given you the grace for you to know the mysteries of the 
kingdom. So be encouraged. Don't be disappointed. Don't be frustrated. You know, because to you, God has given the, you know, the grace to know the mysteries of the kingdom. That is why when everyone was trying to figure out who this Jesus is, they were trying to put him, place him. Some said that he was John the Baptist. Some says he was a prophet. Some says he was Elijah. Okay, and others said other things, but what did the disciples say? You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. Why? Because why? Why was it no given to them? Because it was given to them to know the hidden truth of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, but he said, you know, for you is given the grace to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But he said, you know, the general public. The people, the crowd that come to listen to me, they have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. And they have hearts that they cannot understand the mysteries of the kingdom. So in order for me to bridge that gap for me, in order for me to communicate to them the truths, the mysteries, the revelations of the kingdom that I come from, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, here's what I am doing. What am I doing? I'm speaking to them in mysteries. Okay, I'm taking stories from their world to help them see the things of my world. And that is why I'm using parables. And he's saying in that process of giving them an explanation of the stories from their own world, you know, he's saying that they would know how the kingdom of God works. Okay. And he says, you know, um, in, but in that process of giving an explanation to his disciples, Jesus is also telling them something. He's telling them, you know, how the kingdom of God works. If you have, you're going to given you're going to be receiving more okay so he's giving them he's giving his disciples an explanation about how the kingdom of god works he's saying you know for those who have more will be given or they will be given abundance if you have little and you're not doing anything about that you will lose even what you have okay so what is jesus trying to say here what is Jesus trying to say here? He's saying something very, very important about the kingdom of God. He's saying, you know, as people who have special grace, you've got revelation concerning the things, the mysteries, the truth of the kingdom of God. And all this he's talking about in the context of understanding the mysteries of the kingdom of God. So he's telling his, his, uh, his disciples, you've got the revelation and you're going after more and when you've got revelation and you're going after more what is god going to give you he's going to give you more and more he's going to give you abundance but you know if you got the revelation and you're not doing anything about that even that little revelation that you've got you know what are you in a risk of they're not you know, the risk of not getting anything more and you're also in a greater risk of losing the little that you have so concerning revelation and concerning the mysteries or the revelation, the truths or the mysteries of the kingdom of God, Jesus is saying, hey, you have to take them very, very seriously. Okay. What do you need to take seriously? You have to go after more of the revelations of the truth of the mysteries of the truths of the word of God. And then you will have abundance because why because grace has been given to you as my disciples to understand the mysteries and the truth so you already have it so what should you do you have to you know you have to take it seriously you have to go after more of it and then you will receive abundance but if you don't do anything with the little you have you risk losing even the little that you have okay so this one Reminder to all of us, God has given us the grace, uh, you know, to understand his mysteries, his understand his truth. But, you know, he will reveal more to us if we are more zealous, desperate and eager and longing 
to receive more of his revelations, more of his mysteries, more of his um, truth. And then he also says another thing, um, Jesus says, tells his disciples, he said, listen, you know, if I can speak in parables and get them to understand what I'm saying, which means get past their blinded eyes, their deaf ears, their hearts that is not able to discern, to understand by using this, by uh, uh, understand the mysteries of God. He's saying by using these parables, I can actually get them, you know, to know what is happening in my kingdom. I can get them to accept the truth. I can get them to, uh, you know, receive the gospel, you know. And when they receive the truth, when they receive the, the gospel through these parables, what is going to happen? They're going to change. They're going to get converted. They're going to get transformed, okay. They're going to repent and they're going to experience my healing and they're going to experience my salvation. That means they're going to experience my so so okay so the point is this you know when you get an understanding of the mysteries of god it opens your life up to the working of god okay when you get an understanding of the mysteries of god it opens your life to the working of God. So that is why Jesus is saying, hey, you have, as my disciples, received the grace, but the crowd, the people don't know. They have not received the grace, but, you know, they have eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear, hearts that cannot perceive. That is why I'm speaking in parables. And why am I speaking in parables to them? So that they can hear, understand, and when they understand, they're going to get converted, they're going to repent, they're going to change, they're going to experience salvation, and they're going to experience my healing. Okay, so the point is this, that when we have an understanding of the mysteries of God, it's going to open our lives up to the working of God. But the truth is that understanding the mysteries is very, very important understanding the secret truths of his kingdom is very very important uh, because you know only then can we enter into the fullness of what god wants for us and you know we can do his work we can pursue his kingdom we can pursue the work of god in our lives and in you know the place that he has placed us okay um okay so we need to get an understanding of the mysteries. So you need to pursue the mysteries. And then you get an understanding of the mysteries. It opens your life to the saving, healing, and the delivering work of the Lord or God or the King of his kingdom in our lives. Okay. So in Matthew chapter 13, um, we'll continue with verses um, 34 and 35. Uh, let's just read that. Verses 34 and 35, please. Matthew chapter 13, it just continues to tell us in verse 34 and 35 what Jesus wants to say about parables. Yeah. Matthew chapter 13, 34 and 35. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables and without a parable he did not speak to them. But it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Amen. So when Jesus was speaking in parables, what was he actually fulfilling? He was fulfilling a prophecy. Okay. But we must also see this, that, you know, these parables are now unveiling to us things that were hidden from the time, from the beginning of time, from the beginning of the foundation of the world. Okay. So when we read parables, you just don't read it as a story, but within each parable is a hidden truth. A hidden truth that was not unveiled to us from the beginning of time, from the foundation of time. Okay. So I want to challenge us. You know, many of us have read these parables, you know, and uh, we have looked at it as nice stories. And some we have also colored it in Sunday school as the uh, you know, Sunday school children, children's church children, uh, you know, and we've done all of these kind of things with these parables. That, But, you know, I want to challenge us, you know, if we look at these parables 
as kind of avenues of getting a grip of unseen realities, of understanding the mysteries of God. And if you will, on purpose, examine those parables and say, you know, and look at what God is saying, then, you know, you will understand what he is revealing to you, what he's telling you, or what he is talking about the unseen mysteries of his kingdom. Okay? So if you examine these parables and say, God, you know, what are you telling me through these parables? You know, God, I want to get a grip of the mysteries of your kingdom. I want to get a grip of the truth that is hidden since the foundation of the world. And you can also say, God, God, can you open my eyes and can you open my ears to understand my, and my heart to perceive and understand these mysteries? Then I will know what you are trying to tell me, and I will receive the working of your kingdom in my life. Okay. So even as we are looking at these parables, I'd just like you all to say this, you know, small prayer in your heart, saying, God, you know, um, even as you are going to examine these parables, what are you telling me through these parables? I want to get a grip of the your mysteries. I want to get a grip of the truth that has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Now, God, open my eyes, my ears, so that I can understand, I can receive the mis mysteries. Then I will, I will be able to receive the working of your kingdom in my life. Okay? So, um, I want us to go after these parables with that intent of receiving an understanding of the mysteries so that we can experience the working of God in our lives. Okay, can we do that this morning? Or even as we're going to do it uh, next week? Okay, and not just treat these parables as nice um, stories. Okay. Now, uh, there are many parables that Jesus uh, talked about and communicated to us. We'll just look at a few of the parables. Okay. Um, the first parable that he communicated to his disciples was that of the sower and the seed. Okay. Uh, the parable of the kingdom and the king's word. The sower and the word is the kingdom of God. Okay. So we're going to look at that. Can we read uh, Matthew chapter 13, um, verses 8 to 23? We also see this in, Matt, in Mark chapter 4 and Luke chapter 8. Yeah. Matthew chapter 13, verses 18 to 23. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulations or persecutions arise because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he, now he who received seed among the thrones is he who hears the word and cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. Okay. So here, you know, um, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, you know, Lord, this is the first time that we are kind of hearing you talk to us in parables. So please help us to understand what you are telling us, please explain to us the parable of the sower. And we see that Jesus goes about explaining the parable of the uh, sower. Okay. So here he's basically talking about the kingdom of God. And the parable of the sower has to do with the word of the kingdom. Okay. Okay. The seeds that is the word of the kingdom. Okay, so it is the so what is this the word of the kingdom? It is the word of the king. What the king of the kingdom has spoken is the word of the 
thing and it has to do with God's words. And he says, I'm revealing to you something about the kingdom of God using the story that you are so familiar with. They're all familiar with, you know, the farming that is happening because everywhere they see is fields. And so he's saying, I'm talking about the sower who went to sow the seeds, but actually the seed is the word of the kingdom, the word of the king, the the, the words that the king has already spoken in, and it has to do with the words of God. So he's talking about the word of the kingdom and we'll stop here and uh, we'll continue uh, next class. Anyone has any doubts? Yeah. A parable we saw John Matthew chapter 13, 10 to 17, like that uh, Jesus told to disciples that uh, like when they asked why you speak in parables, uh, Jesus uh, answered like to you the mysteries of heaven was given, but for them it's not. That's why I'm talking in parables. But if we see, there are also times uh, that uh, disciples did not did not understand the parables and they came to Jesus and they asked like what is the meaning of it so how we can tell it like their mysteries were given to them because there are times they did not understand the parable yes the mysteries the grace and the mysteries is given to them means they jesus is going to reveal the mystery to them they have the opportunity to to get receive the understanding compared to the crowd yes later on yes yes Yes, and so they're just learning the culture of understanding what Jesus is trying to say and how he's revealing the mysteries to them. Okay, thank you everyone for joining class. I'll uh, meet you next week. Have a blessed week. Thank you.